Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Dibble Institute's second Wednesday webinar for June 2024, Solutions of Success Using Mind Matters in Juvenile Justice with our fantastic presenters, Kelly and Sarah, who we'll be introducing um, in just a, a couple of slides here. Before we get started, I wanna do a couple of housekeeping things, the general technical questions. If you cannot hear the presentation, please exit the webinar, um, try and sign back in, sometimes that fixes it or you can also call in on your phone as that tends to solve any issues. Um, if you can, if you can look at the control panel for just a quick moment, we wanna see how many of you here are new to the Dibble Institute. So if you can take a second to locate the hand button on the GoToWebinar control panel. If you're new to Dibble, please go ahead and, and click that button so we can see about how many folks here are new to us today. It seems like we've got a lot of um, returning friends and a, a handful, no pun intended, of new folks joining us on today's webinar. So we're happy to have those of you who are returning, and we're also just as happy to um, have those new folks joining us for today's session. I do want to take a quick second to note that there are some handouts for today's webinar. You can also locate those in your control panel under the handouts section. Um, we've got our case study. Um, so just go ahead and, and download those and keep those handy for you to review. The other thing I want to draw your attention to is the questions box that's located in your control panel. There will be time at the end of today's presentation for question and answers. So please go ahead and take a look at that um, and type any questions that you've got for our presenters there. And we will get to that at the end of the presentation. So before we get into today's topic, I want to turn it over to Janelle Zachary who is going to go ahead and introduce the Dibble Institute as well as our presenters today. So, Jonel, take it from here. Thank you, Rachel. And hello, everyone. Welcome to our second Wednesday webinar. We are excited and hope you enjoy the content that we have for today. Um, now, a little more about the Dibble Institute. For those of you who may be newer to us and wondering how our name came to be, on this slide, you'll actually see a picture of Charlie and Helen Dibble, who are the founders of the Dibble Institute. Charlie did a lot of work with youth during his retirement. Uh, he saw a lot of them having difficulties around their relationships or when their parents were having difficulties with their relationships that how it impacted children. Charlie had the brilliant idea to translate research into teaching tools that could then be made widely available. So the Dibble Institute is not a direct service provider, but rather we develop research-based practices and make them available for people like you. If you're wondering, and on this next slide, you're going to see all of the places where we've had impact. The Dibble Institute is a national independent nonprofit organization. We have clients in all 50 US states who are providing direct services. And last year, based on uh, some of our conservative estimates, we believe that we've reached the number of youth that you see on the screen, over 126,000 youth. So we're very grateful to all of you who are here learning innovative ways and innovative approaches to continue finding and resourcing and accessing our youth and who are doing this important work with young people. So thank you. It may be helpful for you to know our mission, and our mission is to help young people successfully navigate their intimate relationships through important information to help build their knowledge and relationship building and skills-based practices. We know that from having these conversations with young people pulls a lot of levers in a lot of different areas, including pregnancy prevention, uh, dating violence prevention, mental health, job and workforce readiness, and so many others, including what you'll see today with working with youth in um, uh, juvenile uh, justice involved youth. Um, one thing that we do believe highly is in addition to our mission is our work is guided by our values but we believe in research all of our programs are research-based and we continue to strive for evaluations on our programs to demonstrate their impact and effectiveness and with this it also means that updates are regularly made to our programs as we learn new information 
exactly like the updated research that will be discussed and presented in our webinar today. We also believe in safe, stable, and nurturing families. This is another core value that we believe in and families of all different formations. So our goal for young people is to be raised in these families. And lastly, we believe that relationship education is for everyone. Exclamation point, it's for everyone. All of us can improve our relationships and make sure that our programs are equally reflective of that. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest for today. I'll first start with Kelly Tanner. Kelly Tanner is the Director of Youth Services for Arizona Youth Partnership, also known as AZYP. AZYP is a prevention organization that built solid foundations for youth and families by partnering with Arizona communities to prevent and solve local issues such as, but not limited to, substance abuse, youth homelessness, lack of educational opportunities, human trafficking, teen pregnancy prevention, and challenging family dynamics. Kelly's work at AZYP began in 2011 as a healthy relationship educator. From 2012 through the present, Kelly has worked across many counties in Arizona, including Kingman and Yavapai counties, where she's overseen, expanded, or served many roles for runaway and homeless youth shelters. She has over 18 years experience with at-risk juvenile delinquent foster care and system youth. Her expertise is program management and trauma-informed care with adolescent youth and 15 years experience in building coalitions and supporting grassroots efforts of communities. Kelly has also acquired experience in systems, bureaucratic navigation, and is passionate about bringing the most comprehensive services to runaway homeless and trafficked youth with little or no access to resources. Today, Kelly has with her a special guest who is also our special guest, Sarah Colbert. Sarah earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Sociology from Eastern Illinois University and a Master of Science degree in Family and Human Development from Arizona State University. Sarah has over 20 years of experience in working with system-involved youth and their families. As a probation officer, Sarah has informed us that there may be a fire drill and that we're equally prepared and how to navigate. But Sarah has worked with adults and juveniles helping to rehabilitate and facilitate change. Most recently, Sarah has developed programs to overcome barriers and provide services needed in rural counties while developing invaluable partnerships with stakeholders. Outside of work, Sarah enjoys spending time with her family and being outdoors. So without further ado, we'd like to extend a big welcome to both Sarah Colbert and Tully Kelly Tanner for joining us today. Kelly, Sarah. Thank you so much, Janelle, and thank you so much to everyone joining us on the call. Um, we are so, uh, we feel very blessed to be here and we're really excited to share um, some of our knowledge with you because we know that working with youth is not always the easiest thing and especially uh, juvenile justice or system involved youth can be um, challenging. So um, Janelle was so gracious to introduce us um, to go a little further between Sarah and I, we have worked together for about the last 12, 13 years, um, we live in a very rural county in Arizona, northern Arizona, and there is an extreme lack of services. And so we, many years ago, decided that uh, we can't do this work alone. And um, we have built uh, partnerships, not only amongst programs within our own agencies, but with other agencies to bring um, comprehensive services to youth and their families. So um, today we're going to um, be talking about the special needs in rural communities, um, some tips and tricks of the trade of engaging youth, um, utilizing evidence and informed practices, talk a little bit about um, how we in implement mind matters and where we implement mind matters, um, and talk about some talk about some practical skill building um, within the youth that we work with, uh, and then some of the impacts that we've seen. And at the end, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. 
Okay. I just wanted to say thank you, uh, Janelle, the Double Institute, and Kelly for inviting me to speak here today as well. Uh, very excited to be here and go over this agenda with you and share some of, you know, the the tips and tricks, like Kelly said, and things that we have discovered have worked for us and things that didn't work so well for us. So we can maybe save you some of that trouble. Um, but Again, we really welcome some questions at the end and really want to know uh, what you want to know and hopefully we can help you guys uh, form some partnerships like we have. Okay, next slide. So we are in rural Mojave County. I'll give you just a little tiny synopsis. We're in the Mojave Desert, so it's hot, especially right now. We are in a heat wave and a heat warning. Um, we are the fourth largest county in the United States by area. So you can imagine there's little pockets of people all over the county. Um, our county has a lot of extreme, extreme rural areas where people are living, where youth are living without water or power, um, kind of like the pioneer lifestyle, so to speak. Um, Sarah and I both live in the county seat, which is Kingman, Arizona. Uh, we primarily, uh, the larger communities that we serve are Kingman, Bullhead City and Lake Havasu City. So all very diverse and um, interesting areas. So Kingman is kind of more in the mountains. Um, Bullhead City is down on the river and then Lake Havasu City is a vacation destination. Uh, nonetheless, there is youth in all three counties that um, need the skill building and uh, need our services. Um, we have a extreme lack of services in this area uh, when it comes to mental health, um, health care, uh, programs for youth with substance abuse issues. Um, we have no juvenile beds for, um, for inpatient treatment. Um, so Sarah does run a program for that for youth that are detained. However, um, as far as inpatient, that is more substance abuse related, but as far as inpatient, there are no beds. So you can, you can kind of feel the difficulties. We have to send our uh, youth out of county a lot, and that can make it very difficult for us to um, engage families in their youth's treatment. So that's a little tiny piece of beautiful downtown <laughs> no downtowns, beautiful scenic rural Mojave County, Arizona. Um, and yeah. and just, just to share too, um, for those of you that are not familiar with Mojave County, we actually um, include the Grand Canyon in our county and the Grand Canyon actually separates part of our county from the rest of it. And so we have to take about a four hour drive from Kingman, go around into Nevada, up into Utah, and then back down to what we call our Colorado Strip area to serve some of our uh, definitely more um, more rural counties right there, more rural part of the county right there. So it, we just have a lot of challenges. Our county is over 13,000 square miles. That's a lot of windshield time to try to get to where these services are needed. Uh, demographically, we're, we're a majority uh, Caucasian, Hispanic, and Native American. We include several different Native American uh, reservation lands in Mojave County. And so uh, we have a very diverse and unique population that we're trying to serve as well. Mojave County uh, is averages approximately 16 to 17% um, of people in the poverty level, and that's above the national average of 12.5% poverty level. And so we're also dealing with a lot of those factors and barriers as well when we're trying to provide services for youth and families. Next slide. So addressing the needs. So we have talked a little bit about the um, the diverse population that we serve as well as um, the area that we have to cover. And so a lot of times, um, I said it earlier, we can't just do this by ourselves. So we have to have a lot of people coming to the table um, and having co real conversation and asking the questions, what truly is the need? What are we seeing upstream? What is happening? And how do we um, do some prevention services in order to, um, to lower, you know, lower recidivism, lower um, system youth getting involved in the system to begin with, um, the braiding of services, there's so many times where we have to bring all additional partners in at the table to say, okay, well, I can provide this piece. Can you provide this piece? 
and we all come together and really um, try to make it, like I said earlier, uh, comprehensive. Um, and also finding the appropriate programming. So that sometimes can be a challenge to find um, the right programming for the right communities and the right culture. Um, and so we we really do are very cognizant about thinking about those things. And so um, the, one of the things that I would like Sarah to talk about, and one of the great things that is uh, our partnership with um, juvenile probation is just the mutual respect and understanding of each other's um, own boundaries and own guidelines, um, and then our honest communication with each other in order to um, get over things that maybe don't work so great for one or the other or both of the agencies or any of the agencies involved. Absolutely, thank you, Kelly. So um, juvenile probation has at its core a, a purpose of rehabilitation. And so for those of you that maybe you're not in the juvenile justice world, um, maybe you think it's more punitive. And while there is a need for a punitive side, we do have to keep the community safe. Uh, we are definitely in the business of rehabilitating and supporting youth. And so once our mission is out and our mission was known amongst some of our stakeholders and providers, specifically Arizona Youth Partnership, uh, it just made perfect sense that we should work together because we're serving the same people. Um, those, those youth that they are trying to reach are the same youth that are on probation with us. And the same rehabilitative, ser rehabilitative services that probation is really wanting our youth to have that's what they're offering and so i mean it just really it makes sense it's a no-brainer that we work together um, for these kids but it only works if we make sure that we're sharing um, the each step of our goal along the way so um, probation in itself has a lot of terms and rules and regulations set forth by the court and we have to make sure that our juveniles are following those and our partners can't help us follow that if they don't know what they are. So first and foremost, we have to share the terms and conditions of probation and the expectations of the court, no matter which piece of the juvenile justice system the kid is in. And so uh, being open and honest with things like, hey, this person can't be around this other person, or uh, Johnny has a curfew of seven o'clock and I know your program goes until eight, we need to make sure we have documentation from your facilitator so that he doesn't get in trouble with the court. Um, just simple things like that, all the way to, uh, unfortunately, you know, Danny and Joe can't be in the same group together because Danny assaulted Joe and Joe's in fear of being in this group together, those kind of things. Obviously, almond names made up. Um, and so I think it's important that we share those kind of basic things and then to observe some of the groups. So I'll, I'll get into some of the programs a little later on, making sure we have time because I could talk about these programs for a long time. But in particular, um, our evening reporting center here at Probation, Project AIM utilizes uh, Mind Matters and other programs that Arizona Youth Partnership offers. And so I sit in on some of those groups every once in a while and uh, just observe how are things going, how are my staff uh, making sure that the kids are doing what they're supposed to, how the, are the facilitators doing, and how is that program itself relating to the youth that are in there. And then I can take that back to Kelly and her partners and, and talk about very openly, you know, this person has a great heart, but maybe not a good fit for this, but this other program that you do, they're really good at that. Or I'm just not sure that this, the way that this was taught really got through to the probation youth. Maybe we can teach this using an example or something like that, or let's bring in somebody that's been there that can talk about how they used this skill. And, and really being honest about how we are working toward our goals, I think is really, really important. Um, I don't know, Kelly, is that no. anything to throw that, in there? That was perfect. I, 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 I love doing these webinars, um, but sometimes um, it's all like fun and rainbows and beautiful things. But we, as we all know, doing the work and doing direct service with these vulnerable populations, it doesn't always come out like you want it to come out or like you are intending it for it to come out. And my point is, and Sarah, you said it so perfectly, it's, really just having those open and honest um, recaps and kind of debriefing and having that regular open communication, but also knowing that the trust is there. Like 
we're going to do our part to make it right. And then, you know, Sarah and her team are also going to help us to learn, you know, maybe we didn't quite fit in some of the terms and conditions that are required. And then we can work together to um, work those things out and to make it better for the youth uh, in the long run. So um, thank you for doing that because I knew you would talk about that perfectly. And um, just just the symbiotic part of it, like we are getting it because we need to get the word out there, right? Most of us right. are grant funded, right? So we have to have the numbers, so to speak. We tell our funders we're going to serve this many people. So obviously we're going to partner with the youth, that, the folks that work with youth that need it most. However, we're also providing a service to those youth that for probation that are helping them rehabilitate them. So um, again, it's just talking about what is the need and how do we work together within the resources we have. Definitely. Something that uh, Kelly and I, um, our teams, not necessarily, not necessarily us um, at each time, but something that our teams do is um, meet on a regular basis and explain our role as as a provider as azyp and as probation um, and make sure that staff understand what the goal is what we're all about how uh, how we operate what our restrictions are within the core or within the grant guidelines of a certain program so that we know um, where the other one is coming from and any of that feedback then is not personalized against uh, against us, but more so we know like, okay, we have these restrictions, we're working towards a common goal, here's how they're getting it, here's how we're getting it, and we meet together in the end. So um, I think that communication and um, just really sharing that knowledge with all of our team so that everyone understands on Kelly's side where juvenile justice is coming from, what we're trying to do, uh, and then everyone understands on our side that how their programs, um, Mind Matters, Love Notes, those kind of things really fit in to our case plans and probation and what we're trying to do to rehabilitate youth. Perfect. Next slide, please. So engaging youth. So sometimes um, it's pretty difficult, right? You have a kid, we all know, um, who has experienced trauma and doesn't trust you and doesn't doesn't want to do uh, breathing exercises with you and basically would like to put their hoodie in, on in their earbuds. Um, and so I just wrote, wrote a few things on this slide just to remind folks, I know most of you probably have heard these, these tips before, um, but just to add some tools to your toolbox. Um, number one is um, meeting them where they are, right? Because not all kids are the same, not all approaches cookie cutter. Uh, we cannot use the same approach for, for every kid. And they're in different places in their lives, in their journey, uh, in their recovery. Um, and so I think just meeting them where they are and accepting that um, youth success looks different on every kid. And and really um, celebrating those successes when they do happen, um, however small or large that they may be. Um, so one of the things that I do um, in, my, in my work is I teach trauma-informed care. And one of the things that I say all the time, and you guys, I'm dating myself by saying this, but check yourself before you wreck yourself. And this speaks to more than just teaching or facilitating in the classroom. Um, Sarah kind of mentioned, you know, within the parameters, we really, we don't try to take those things personal when there needs to be adjustments um, because it is what it is. And we have to follow those rules and the guidelines with on both sides. Um, but truly checking yourself before you wreck yourself. I know some of all of us have our own lives, right? And we all have our own triggers and our own things. And sometimes we really have to just check all of that at the door because most of the time when a youth is acting out against you or if they're just not engaging, it's not about you. It is truly their own, what's going on internally. And so um, just teaching that no bad behavior is not, you know, trauma is not an excuse for bad behavior. However, it is a reason. And that reason is not you. And so um, just really remembering to check those emotions at the door and don't take um, some of the behaviors that they exhibit personally. 
Um, strengths based. We all have those kids that uh, are like, I want to sit in front, I want to help, I want to do that. Um, utilize that to your advantage. Um, it's always great because this, if this is a strength for them, then um, we want to be strengths based. We don't want to call out kids um, that are clearly not willing to, <laughs> to speak out in class. Um, that just alienates and embarrasses them. Maybe as you go along in the, in the relationship building um, or in the, um, in the curriculum itself, you may be able to, to call on that, uh, that individual based upon some of the behaviors that you've seen as you've gone, gone along, but definitely not in the first few. Um, you're always gonna have those kids that want to help and utilize that to your advantage. Um, so I'm gonna let Sarah talk about the peer leadership part because she sees it a lot and uh, it's really- I, I do so much. So we, uh, right now we have, and sorry, I'm gonna try not to go down a rabbit hole of Hope Garden, but I am gonna talk about Hope Garden. So <laughs> Kelly alluded to uh, earlier, our program here in detention, it's called Hope Garden. It's a 10 week substance abuse treatment program held in a structured setting. Our kids are detained for the entire time. They go to school during the day and the afternoon and evening. We work with our stakeholders and our partners to provide therapy and um, skills building classes. And then after they leave, they have 10 weeks of aftercare. Throughout the entire thing, their families are involved because we know that um, building those strong, healthy families is so important to success. And so um, there, there is family portions to that, family therapy, fam uh, parent only programs, things like that. Um, however, in a Hope Garden, we have we currently have four girls, and they're getting ready to graduate on Friday. And I'm so proud of them. It's been a rough group. Uh, started out where I wasn't sure uh, if I was going to make it, but I did, <laughs> and they did, and we all survived. And they have grown and changed so much. But what was really cool to see with these girls is that they are holding each other accountable. They want to show everyone that comes in what they're learning. They want to, um, every, every day that I come in, they're like, hey, guess what we just learned in group last night? And they'll show me an art project or they'll show me a drawing or they'll tell me about a different skill that they learned. Uh, we have one in particular that gets very, uh, gets very angry and she talks about her body scan, right? She uses that skill to calm herself down. And so it's just really great to see them embracing it. But then also when other people are getting upset, I'm seeing these girls right now um, say, hey, remember this, hey, remember that. And I didn't even plan to do this, but this morning I'm looking over cause there's a letter over there. One of my girls gave me a letter and she said, now you're gonna have more Hope Garden girls, right? And I said, well, yeah, we're gonna have more cohorts. She's like, okay, I wrote a letter to your future cohorts and I want them to know what I learned and I want them to share this. And so she goes and talks about her experiences and the things that she's learned and what they can pull from that. And so allowing her to express those things and um, just be proud of the progress that she's made, that's what we're seeing and some of that um, and really helping to embrace that and to, to really bring out that skill in them. And it's just been awesome to see. So we definitely see that a lot in our with this group of Hope Garden girls. Sorry, I tried not to talk too much about it, but no, that that was okay. actually perfect. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so a few of the other things, um, having those healthy boundaries, we want we always want folks to be relatable, right? Um, mm -hmm. Being able to share um, stories, personal stories, with the youth that we serve, but in a very um, in a very healthy way. We don't want to uh, glorify crime and um, we don't, <laughs> we, we certainly don't want to get too deep into our own personal lives. Um, but I think with that, that also creates a level of safety with the youth um, because it, you never know what kind of triggers may arise from that. Um, you may be telling a personal story thinking that you are um, engaging with them or you're relating with them and it may trigger something in them that uh, it causes them to break down or have some sort of negative reaction. So always keeping in mind um, those boundaries that you are there to support and facilitate and to 
you know, engage them and to teach skills, but um, keeping the personal, um, very personal information about yourself out of it. And then respecting different learning styles. I don't know about you, but I am a doodler. I am absolutely um, a, I'm a visual learner and a doodler. So um, we always provide um, uh, colored pencils in our classes um, or crayons. I would not recommend markers. Um, a lot of times the kids will draw on desks or on themselves. Um, we have been down that road and that that hasn't been a, a good thing so but definitely the colored pencils if at all possible because the workbooks are um, phenomenal and um, they are engaging and they do you know if the youth is doodling and they see the next question they may not be looking at you the entire time and that's okay again going back to checking yourself it's not personal this may be how they learn and how they are um, engaging in the material well, and I, along with that, I can tell you that at our admin meetings, we have boxes of coloring books and crowns and fidget tools, right? Mm -hmm. Because everybody does learn in those different styles. And sometimes when we're talking about hard things, we need to put that energy into something else so it doesn't come out as a negative reaction. And so um, it makes sense that when kids are learning about coping skills, they're going to be thinking about something that may have been traumatic for them. They need something to channel that energy. So I wanna talk just a minute about engaging some of the youth in juvenile justice. And a couple of things that have really stuck with me over the years. The first one is the saying, your day starts with breakfast. And that being that you can't remember all the holdovers from yesterday or the day before, and you can't remember the holdover kids. And so for those of you that have worked in the social service fields for any length of time, I'm guessing you may have had some generations come through your door. And the worst thing that we can do, and I really try not to do, is compare anyone to your mother, your father, your uncle, your sister. Um, that is very, um, a very hard thing to do, something that's really um, comes across as disrespectful to a lot of youth. And we need to treat them as their own person. Uh, not their last name. And in small rural communities, we often see the same family members, unfortunately, that come through the system, um, or we know them from, like I said, their sister, their cousin, or whatnot. And so not bringing those preconceived ideas is really important. Um, and then something that I'm sure most of you know, but it's always a good reminder when we're dealing with youth um, to remember that communication is, what do they say? It's 70%, I think, nonverbal. And so remember, remember that. Remember that some of us wear everything on our faces. And the last thing that we need to do is show shock or judgment or biases or, um, or anything like, I'm tired, I'm, I'm bored teaching this class, I just did this three times. You know, we have to make sure that we are communicating that we are there for the youth, they're heard, they're, they're important, we are in, present with them. And I think that's something that we need to make sure um, that we are doing. Thank you. Absolutely. Next slide. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about Mind Matters. Next slide. So we um, uh, talk a little bit about where we implement it. Sarah, uh, we do implement it in Hope Garden. Um, we also implement in their night reporting program for youth that are not detained, that are on probation, um, as well as we have two juvenile shelters here in Mojave County. We implement it there. And then we also do it in schools generally. Um, we are serving those higher need uh, vulnerable youth in schools, sometimes in in-school suspension or in after-school programs. Um, but we are trying, I would say the majority of our clients are um, at risk um, or vulnerable populations. Um, so some of the skill building, if you are at all familiar with uh, Mind Matters, it really helps us to um, manage those tough emotions without having to go and sit in a chair in a counselor's office, right? These are just practical skills that we can teach um, pretty much to anybody. Um, I know there was a case study done um, in Air for Arizona Youth Partnership and how we, um, how we changed the curriculum in order to um, cater to different 
um, ages, cultures, or genders, but truly the skills in here can be used by anyone. Um, I also tell all of the people on my team um, regularly, hey, have you done 54321? Have you taken a minute? Have you um, done the body scan? Have you done some tapping today? Um, I actually did some this morning just to kind of refresh myself. So um, utilizing, remembering that when you're facilitating as well is um, there is something there for everyone, um, but there's also things that may not work for everyone. And so just utilize teaching all the skills and being comprehensive in that and letting the youth really decide what is going to work best for them. So um, the other things that we can teach with this, uh, with the skill building within Mind Manners are, are listed. I don't like to read, but definitely new skills. I think a lot of youth are like, wow, I never even thought of that. And that's so easy. I can use this in the classroom. I can use this when I'm having a meltdown at home or I'm in a fight with my sibling or um, I, I just don't know what to do and I can't grasp my own you know, emotions. Um, they're all just short, practical uh, skills that they can um, learn. And then once they do learn them and start using them, we see um, a building in confidence like, hey, I learned this, I overcame this, I was having a meltdown, but I used this skill and um, I feel better and I didn't I didn't do anything that was going to get me in trouble, basically. So um, and that kind of speaks into delinquency prevention. And I will turn it over to my my gal, Sarah. Absolutely. Um, I think there's a couple of things uniquely special about the Mind Matters curriculum. And one of them is the repetition. Right. We all learn by repetition. You're supposed to say, I don't know, seven, ten things. Who, times to learn it. I don't remember. Um, but you're supposed to uh, be able to learn things the more that you do them. That makes sense. And so the really cool thing about the book and about the lessons and the way it's put together is that it is um, repetitive and teaches the same things over and over. And sometimes I think out if you, and facilitators are on there, the kids are going to be like, oh, I already know. Um, but we make them do it anyway. And before you know it, they're like, ooh, can I lead the body? Can I lead the tap? Can I, you know, they want to choose which ones they're doing. So um, it's just really cool that the whole repetition part is what really is going to stick with them. So I just wanted to say a piece on that. Um, with our delinquency prevention part, I want to talk about we, in juvenile justice, we have several different levels of uh, intervention. And sometimes um, somebody can get in trouble, they get a referral is what it's called, and they don't necessarily go through the court system. They don't end up on probation, they don't have a probation officer, they don't come to Hope Garden or Project AIM, and so um, they don't have the benefit of learning these skills. So um, we have a diversion program and specific diversion officers that are able to utilize these programs, and so if somebody gets in trouble for um, a bullying or a shoplifting or even getting in a fight at school or criminal damage because you slammed your door at home because you were mom, mad at your mom. Um, we can utilize these programs in our diversion. So kids never have to even go through the court system. They just learn these practical skills and then um, and that's it. And for the majority of our diversion, we never see them again, which is amazing. Um, we then have our levels of probation as far as um, short-term probation, standard probation, intensive probation, and those just uh, increase, as you can imagine, for time and, and supervision level. But what we found is that for every level from diversion through juvenile intensive probation is that these skills resonate and these skills are important. Uh, we have seen just with... Um, and I just looked at Mind Matter specific completions, but we have seen in Hope Garden an 89% completion, successful completion, and in Project AIM, a 70% successful completion. And so for those of you that have any work in juvenile justice, you know those are super high success numbers. Uh, we normally run below 50, and that's not to say that probation isn't successful, it's just that the nature of the people on probation, sometimes those people move away. They um, they get sentenced to a, a higher level of care. They go to an inpatient treatment. Uh, perhaps they go to the juvenile prison system. So there are lots of ways for somebody to exit the program. 
Um, so the fact that we have those high of numbers for a successful completion of the program is, is pretty outstanding. Uh, and so I think we definitely use that in different areas there. Like I said, diversion all the way through intensive probation. Okay. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah. So the impact, um, Sarah will have to speak a lot more on this than me because she, uh, she, she does see the impact. I will say from the perspective of youth in shelter, um, it's probably pretty similar, but we see a lot of youth being able, after completing Mind Matters, um, really just being able to, um, to feel safe and feel like they have built that connection with that trusted adult, um, that they've accomplished something because they've completed and they've learned valuable skills that they can use the rest of their lives. Um, being able to learn uh, open communication and then pro-social, you know, Sarah spoke about how they support each other and how um, they work together on kind of checking themselves. And that is the impact that we've seen is bu just building those um, protective factors and, you know, building the resiliency for their futures and their, and their journey through life. Um, so I will let Sarah talk a little bit about what she sees with her youth um, on the impact side. Absolutely. So I know way back when, when we first started this, uh, this webinar, Janelle introduced me as a probation officer. Um, I actually now am a juvenile detention administrator. And so my days are spent inside uh, the juvenile detention facility, in the classroom, or in the, the day rooms or in the pods with all the juveniles that um, are detained at the moment. And so I really get to see firsthand how it is hard for them to control their emotions, that it's hard for them to uh, deal with what's going on in their life. Just being in the juvenile justice system itself and being in detention is a trauma for these kids. And um, while I do know that it is a necessary part of the juvenile justice system, it's not necessarily one that, um, you know, kids really build a lot of resiliency from coming to detention, you know, um, but we do have to provide for public safety and uh, court sanctions and things like that. Um, but what I see is that it can be traumatizing to come here and we need to do something and implement something on our side to negate that trauma and to try to um, give them those skills that when they come in and they can't control their anger and they're mad and they're scared and they were just taken away from their family, um, again, for, you know, maybe the third or fourth time, um, maybe they're in foster care and they've been um, passed around from family to family, uh, all kinds of different things that our population goes through and uh, recognizing that we have to build those skills. And so seeing um, things like Mind Matters implemented in our uh, Hope Garden program while those youth are detained to see the long-term progression of them being able to go from screaming in their room when they're mad for four and a half hours and throwing everything around, uh, spilling water everywhere to, okay, um, can I please have a timeout because I'm feeling overwhelmed. And that's what happened in a, a 10 week period by using these types of programs and seeing the, the way that they recognize some of those emotions now. I think it's, it's uh, really, really impactful to see that. Um, we know that, I won't get too far down into trauma in the brain and things like that, but we know that childhood trauma impacts pathway development. It impacts attachment. And so if as a child, you're going through some of those things that we measure in the ACEs, whether there's abuse, uh, neglect, substance abuse, mental health issues, um, a parent missing in the home, something like that. We know that those kind of things can impact the attachments and the way that a child brain forms. And so knowing that there's research behind these programs that can show that they redevelop pathways is really encouraging. And it's a reason why, while us at Mojave County, but also juvenile justice only use um, evidence-based programs that have those research behind it that really show that we are trying to overcome what childhood trauma has done to the brain. And um, so seeing, I, I'm thinking particularly of another youth that's been in and out of detention several times, but also in and out of 
uh, one of the shelters that Kelly runs, the homeless youth shelter that Kelly runs. And so this, this particular gentleman has been through the My Matters curriculum through there and seeing how he comes back in here, um, able to identify some of the feelings and emotions that he's been going through. Whereas before he could never maintain behaviors and earn behavioral levels in detention because he just couldn't, he could not maintain. He was such an angry kid. And so seeing him be able to now identify what might be causing that emotion, but even better yet, saying, hey, I need to go do this because this helps me. I need to go use this coping skill because that's what helps me. And I think it's it's that kind of everyday thing that you see that really takes us back to realizing that that partnership and that um, that working together and not being in a silo and really reaching our common goal of rehabilitation in these youth and families is so important. Um, I know from a juvenile justice standpoint, our chief justice, the one before it and our upcoming chief justice about to be sworn in has made child and families one of their strategic agenda goals. And so the fact that Dibble and the my and my matter specifically promote safe nurturing families is really important to juvenile justice because again we are guided by our strategic agenda and what we do um, has to has to match what the um, what the chief justice says and so knowing that we are doing that by using this program by partnering with Kelly by using the mind matters is really important to us because then we can report back. Uh, to the Chief Justice that, hey, we're doing your work and here's here's what we're doing, here's what we're seeing. Um, and that has been recognized throughout the state. Uh, so I think it's it's a really cool thing to see what, what we're seeing in juvenile justice by using these programs. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so we will do our last slide before questions. So, so just some final tips and takeaways, um, remembering what the need is um, and how to address it. So if you're seeing a lot of anger issues, you're seeing a lot of um, lack of coping skills, then obviously Mind Matters would be the, you know, would be an answer or a program, um, but really paying attention to that need and addressing it um, in a way that is collaborative and utilizing all of the skills, all of the programming, um, all of the funding sources that you have in your community um, to really bring that comprehensive youth-centered approach. Um, so no community silos. I know we all have our, you know, our numbers to get and things like that. And um, there is definitely need and room for everyone. Um, to provide quality care and the more you collaborate the better because then everybody kind of gets a piece of the pie so to speak but the better part is that the youth have more opportunity to learn different things learn from different facilitators and also build more healthy adult connections and relationships um, finding those quality adult facilitators sometimes can be really difficult take your time and find the right one um, it's so important to um, the programs, the direct care, to really have those folks that are youth-centered, that know about trauma, that um, are, are utilizing evidence-based practices in their facilitation um, practice. And just being able to um, have the ability to build the relationship with youth within boundaries. <laughs> um, so being solution oriented with your with your partners is so important. Again, um, taking the need and saying, what can we do within our parameters to uh, bring the most, um, the biggest bang for our buck, so to speak. And always, always building the protective factors. And that may look different in different uh, kids because kids are different. They may need, you know, um, that more, uh, that adult, um, connection or they may need more um, information on substance use and the dangers because the perception of harm there's just none there um, so just um, making sure that you're zoning in or honing in on each individual youth and lastly planting seeds so 
sometimes it's not all going to be rainbows and happy and you're going to have youth that are going to they're going to buck back and they're not going to you're you're going to think i did not reach this kid this kid did not engage i i'm feeling very defeated but believe me they will come back later or maybe not to you specifically but they will remember how you made them feel in the skills they will remember bits and pieces and you are planting seeds and so i always say that because in our work sometimes you don't always see the results you know you don't see the fruits of your labor and just just remembering um to take care of yourself also check yourself before you wreck yourself but remembering that you are planting seeds whether the the youth show it or not all said, Kelly. Thank you. Uh, it looks like we uh, may have some time for questions. I'm hoping there is some. Chanel? Yes, there are some questions coming in. And I have to say, one, I will now be listening to that song when we sign off today. So thank you for bringing that back to the forefront of my, my brain there. So that will be playing when we log off today. Um, the other thing I want to say is thank you both so much. You're you know, your passion for the youth that you serve and your community and the work that you do is, is so evident. And, and y'all said that it would be so easy for you to talk about this. And that was just very clear in, in today's presentation. So just real quick before we get to the question, thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience. And um, I feel like it, hearing y'all talk it is a great way to ignite um, a flame in a lot of other folks. So I just wanted to say thank you. I'll say it again, but uh with that being said i do want to go to the question so uh you know especially i think in talking about the populations that y'all are working with somebody asked how do you work on connecting youth with a trusted adult when it's highly likely that at least the parents aren't that figure to turn to um and helping them to connect to someone when maybe they don't have somebody nearby so that's a great question and um one that we did struggle with, especially being in such a rural, um, a rural community. And like I said, we have generations of, um, of going through uh, the same system. And so we have just said, I don't know if you've watched that movie, but if you build it, they will come, right? If you ask for it, uh, they will bring it. That's what I found in my community. And so I have put the need out several times. For example, in Hope Garden, we have had um, the parent component. We've had cohorts where no parents could come. And I would reach out to Kelly uh, specifically and say, hey, do you have any staff that could come sit for family dinner time so this kid doesn't eat alone? And I think that's a, a really cool thing that, um, that people are able to do around here. And so I think ask your community partners that are out there, do you have somebody that'll do this? And then uh, additionally, I think with uh, telemed and telephone and Zoom and all that lovely stuff that is going on, we're talking to people around the country right now, there really has been an explosion of peer mentor programs that will connect with you um, via phone or Zoom. And so um, we do, we do uh, encourage people to look for those and we use those ourselves. And so, Unfortunately, a lot of times we can't look to the family for that supportive person. We can be that support to a degree by offering, you know, a smile, uh, look them in the eye, treat them as a human, see them, um, but then make those connections to some of the other people that can step in in your community. Hey Sarah, I don't know, Kelly, you had anything to add. I do want to comment on that to a degree part that you um, pointed out because I do think that's important to recognize and that's something that we emphasize when you go through a training with the Dibble Institute is you know how much and what can you do for these young people and how many um, so if you're not just working with one person right how far can you really extend yourself and what does that look like and also considering your role and mandated reporter status and all of these other things right like what are the boundaries around around that and what and what that looks like um with that that leads into one of the other questions that we got about an interest in training for mind matter so if you are interested in training this is my little shameless plug i am the director of research and training here um we'd be more than happy to get you situated and set up for one of our mind matters training so uh janelle just be ready we will be reaching out to you 
after this is over to top options. And I'm sure Kelly and Sarah, you know, have nothing but wonderful things to say about their training experiences with Dibble. <laughs> but um, I think, let's see. As we wait for maybe another question or two to come in, Joe, did you have anything that popped up that you wanted to ask? Yes. First, Sarah and Kelly, the, I echo Rachel's sentiments. Thank you, Rachel. The, I, I mean, it is evident that you are passionate about the work that you do and your collaborative experiences with each other. So clearly, there's a rapport that has been established and there's a trust that's been built between the both of you that says, we've got this and can you and do you and yes. So now that's here. However, my question is for the individuals that have attended this webinar or the organizations, rather they're looking to get started or working to establish some sort of expansive measure to expand their services amongst their community. Do you have any tips for them on how to begin engaging uh, maybe administrators? And congratulations, Sarah, for your new role. Uh, and my apologies for, for that. Um, but do you have any tips for individuals or organizations looking to engage or sparking that partnership to start with juvenile justice um, systems or administrators to get a program going? I would say if you're currently working with youth that are justice involved or even foster care involved, um, reach out to their caseworkers, reach out to their probation officers and say, hey, you guys have any extra programs available? Um, can I set up a meeting with your administrator to, um, to just offer offer any programs that you are thinking or even just to brainstorm like what are the needs what are the trends you're seeing um, what are some of the things that you think will work within your programs um, and to help the youth and then and then basically it kind of blossoms from there i know funding can always be an issue um, make sure that you're you're looking at um, any and all juvenile related funding sources. Um, we use OJJDP Title II funds for this, um, but there are so many other funding sources that you could utilize um, uh, to make this work within your community. Um, I would also say, as far as the school is concerned, um, just being just being open and honest with the programs that you have they administrators are so busy and they're so overwhelmed with um not so much you know service providers coming in but just you know they've got they've got testing and they've got a you know a whole faculty to manage and all of the things and trying to just be patient and reaching out to them maybe via email or sending them a package of the services that you offer and um just humbly you know, respectfully uh, asking for a meeting and then being very prepared at that meeting because time is money in their life and um, just being respectful of, of time too, so. Thank you so much. I think that's wonderful. And it gives very practical steps for how someone can begin the conversation if that's an area where they're looking to do work. Rachel, I think there may be more questions. There are, but you know, we're talking about time and speaking about time, we're right near the end. So I do want to say for everyone, just because we're, you know, 90 seconds out from that top of the hour, um, that if you submitted a question and we did not get to it in today's session, don't worry, it will not go unanswered. Uh, we will follow up with you to make sure that your questions are addressed. I do want to give um, just one more thank you to Kelly and Sarah for their time today their their passion their wisdom um everything that y'all shared i think it's it's really important and will be really helpful for folks who are either currently serving um this this setting or in this setting or are hoping to break into this area um to to serve their youth in their community so thank you so much again for that passion um and just your time and, and experience and knowledge this afternoon and thank you to everyone who joined us on today's webinar we really appreciate you being here there is a brief survey at the end of the webinar um, so please just a couple of seconds take it take that time to fill it out uh, also the webinar will be available in about three days you'll be getting an email once the recording is um, available and posted and also the handouts that are in the control panel so in case those go missing don't worry you will have access to them in the future and as a heads up, we do have our next webinar on July 10th. 
It's making relationship programs more inclusive for LGBTQ plus youth, finding from the Framing Research Project. So our friends from Mathematica will be joining us. We hope you do too. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you again in July. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.